I'm here with Professor Lubomir Luchuk, Professor of Political Geography at Royal Military College in Canada once again. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, 20th of June is a significant anniversary. Um, tell me what the signif signification, significance of that is. I think most Kingstonians, in fact, most Canadians are not aware of the fact that 100 years ago on the 20th of June, 1920, Canada's first national internment operations came to an end. Between 1914, between the start of the war in August of 1914 and June of 1920, so almost two years after the armistice, which we normally recall as Remembrance Day, um, thousands of Ukrainians and other Europeans, men, women, and children, were rounded up um, as so-called enemy aliens not because they'd done anything wrong, but only because of who they were, where they'd come from. Most had come from the territories of Ukraine, then under the Austro-Hungarian occupation. And so they came with passports, naturally saying, you're an Austro-Hungarian citizen. But their ethnicity was different than their citizenship. That didn't matter. When the war broke out, the government of Canada at first said, just go about your business, don't give us any problems, we won't give you any problems. But very soon thereafter, August 22nd, as a matter of fact, so within a few weeks of the war being declared, uh, the government of Canada passed the War Measures Act. Some of your viewers will remember that act because they have heard of it. Ah, in World War II, Japanese Canadians and some Italians and Germans were rounded up by the War Measures Act. Same act. 1970, the Quebec crisis, 50 years ago this year, the War Measures Act. So three times in the 20th century, the act that was first passed in 1914 was used for internal security purposes. Now, as I say, there was no reason, there was no disloyalty, any treasonous behavior, activity on the part of these Ukrainians and other Europeans, and yet they were rounded up and 24 camps were established across the country. People were forced to do hard labor for the profit of their jailers. They were subjected to all sorts of reporting conditions. 80,000 people were actually required to report regularly. About 8,500 were physically interned. Uh, again, what little wealth they had was confiscated. Much of it was never returned. Um, they were censored in terms of their newspapers and public organizations, uh, disenfranchised even in 1917, literally lost the right to vote, and some were selectively deported after the war. Now, there were also people who uh, died or suffered significant psychological or physical injuries in these camps. Anyway, what um, Kingstonians probably don't understand or fully appreciate is that Kingston's own Fort Henry was the first permanent internment camp during the First World War. I, I was born here. I grew up here. I played on Fort Henry Hill as a kid. Uh, after the Divine Liturgy, after Mass, on Sundays, occasionally, the entire community would go for a picnic. One of the destinations was Fort Henry Hill. I mean, your viewers all know it. Spectacular view of our city. I mean, it's the most gorgeous view of the city you can get. Um, the water, the breeze, the, again, when I was a little boy, the moats, the cannons, you could run around and play and all that stuff. So we would go there and picnic and people would talk. We'd talk about the old country and they'd talk about the Second World War. But no one at that time had any inkling that Fort Henry had been used as an internment camp. And it wasn't until literally 1978 that I found out. So I went to Regiopolis Notre Dame High School, great high school, went to Queens. It wasn't until I started doing my master's at Queens in the Department of Geography under the supervision of my good friend now, Professor Peter Goheen, who assigned me the topic of doing historical geography of Ukrainians in Kingston, which I didn't want to do. And Richard Pierce, the professor of history, who said, use oral histories because there's not that much archival evidence. So out I went with a tape recorder, bored out of my mind, thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to be talking to people like my parents. I grew up with them. I know everything they have to say. And I knew some of the interwar immigrants. And I said, oh, well, OK. Well, lo and behold, one day I went to Colburn Street. You're on Colburn Street, right down the road from where you're sitting right now. And there was a woman there by the name of Mrs. Karatanyuk. She was a little bit, I thought, daft, frankly, at the time. But she was always very generous when we came caroling at Christmas and so on. And she was an interwar uh, immigrant. I knew she was a widow. Her husband had served in the Second World War in the Canadian Army. So I went to talk to her. I didn't have many expectations of getting anything out of her that would be anything of any use to me. But I went. And I said, you know, Mrs. Karatanyuk, 
were there any Ukrainians here when you arrived? You said, yeah, there were a few. They've been here from around the First World War. I go, hmm, that's interesting. She goes, yeah, there's one of them by the name of Nick Sakaluk. Never heard of him. I said, well, where is he? I've never heard of him. She said, oh, well, he moved to Toronto. So I found Nick Sakaluk, and I remember it was the 14th of uh, February, 1978, Valentine's Day. So off I trudged to Toronto, and I interviewed Mr. Sakaluk, and I did the usual kind of questions. I mean, Mr. Sakaluk, were you in Kingston during the First World War? Yes. Great. Wonderful. Um, when did you arrive? 27th of October, 1914, he says. I'm thinking, that was 60 years ago, and you remember that so well? But I, I went on. I had no sort of sense of what was about to come. I said, well, that's interesting. Okay. Um, Where'd you work? It must have been the Davis Tannery, perhaps the locomotive works, the shipyards, or maybe even out in Portsmouth Village at the time in the grain elevators. No. Well, where did you work? Well, Fort Henry. I said, oh, you must have been one of the stonemasons or laborers repairing the fort. He said, no, I was a prisoner, just as nonchalantly as that. <laughs> prisoner? Why? And then he told me his story. And frankly, I didn't, you know, I'll admit this candidly, you know, for anyone who wants to see this. I had no clue really what to ask him because I'd never heard about Canada's first national term in operations, but that's how I found out. And so I interviewed Mr. Sakulu. Tragically, he died in an accident uh, not long thereafter, but we got his voice on record. And that's when the campaign for some kind of recognition and symbolic redress really began. Uh, I wrote a little booklet, um, uh, that Brian Rolson published called Interment Operations, which talks about the role of old Fort Henry World War I. Uh, in, my dis in my MA thesis, there was an appendix, which was the interview with Mr. Sakaluk. Um, I did another little ar uh, article uh, about it and then kind of forgot it until um, 1988, when the Japanese Canadian community had begun really heavily promoting the notion that there should be some kind of apology and compensation for what happened to their community during the Second World War, that I said to some of my friends in the Ukrainian community, well, wait a minute, that's a precedent if Japanese Canadians can reasonably ask for an apology and compensation for what happened to them in the Second World War under the terms of the War Measures Act, why shouldn't we ask for something? And that's actually when Richard Pierce, who I mentioned a moment ago, published my little booklet called A Time for Atonement. And the, the phrase, A Time for Atonement, is actually taken from a daily British Whig editorial from 1917, where an unknown editorialist wrote about how if people were going to be uh, stripped of the right to vote, you know, this is an, a major uh, decision, uh, then sooner or later will have to be atoned for. And I thought, perfect. That's exactly right. And so I set off to secure atonement. I thought it would be, <laughs> frankly, quite easy. People would say, oh, you're right. We didn't know about that. That's, that's outrageous. Um, and this wasn't even, I mean, in those days, Ukrainians were racialized, as the term is used now. We weren't considered to be white. Of course, today we would be. But in the past, East Europeans, Ukrainians, and others like that were generally considered to be rather inferior. You know, and, and not desirable. Uh, good for heavy labor, good for opening up the prairies, that sort of thing, but you really don't want too many of them around. In fact, <laughs> there's some very nasty kinds of comments that we don't need to, we don't need to, to share with your viewers. But the point is, um, pre-war racism and prejudice, wartime xenophobia and hysteria all combined to see this uh, remarkably extensive and intensive intervention into the Ukrainian Canadian community that I think uh, bequeathed a kind of crippling legacy to it. I, I would argue as a historian or political geographer that the community has only in the last few decades perhaps recovered, partially because we ran this campaign, as I said, it began around 1980, mid 1980s. It continued until 2008 when Jason Kenney, who was then the Minister of Multiculturalism and is today the Premier of Alberta, um, signed an agreement with the Ukrainian-Canadian community, fittingly enough, in Stanley Barracks, which was a receiving station for enemy aliens at the CNE in Toronto, providing for symbolic redress and uh, an acknowledgement. We never, by the way, I might add, asked for an apology. We um, thought that was inappropriate. Uh, we never asked for compensation. Uh, in fact, we took our, if you like, our, our, our theme uh, 
uh, for the redress campaign from another survivor, Mary Monkel Haskett. This was a woman who had been born in Montreal. She was six and a half years old when her entire family was rounded up and transported to the Spirit Lake camp in the Abitibi region of north central Quebec. She watched her sister Nellie die there. And when I remember, I remember asking Mary, I said, Mary, you know, are you looking for compensation? Like, say, the Japanese Canadians. There's a precedent. Would you like to get a, a tax free check? Would you like an apology? She said, why should anyone now, today, apologize for something that someone else did decades ago? And she said, Lubomir, if your campaign is going to go forward, my suggestion is the campaign should be about memory, not money. Wow. Just to put this in perspective, um, you know, the, Fort Henry was used as a, as a camp. How yes. many um, camps were there? Well, there were actually 24 camps. The first permanent camp, as I've mentioned, was Fort Henry. Uh, behind me, your viewers can see an image of some of those internees in one of the casements at Fort Henry. The man who's sitting uh, on the floor itself, not on the stool behind him, but the man who's actually sitting, first man on the left, on the ground, that's Nick Sikaluk. Um, and there's a man right behind him with his hand on his shoulder. That's Nick Sikaluk. So that's the photograph he showed me when I went to interview him saying, there I am. Um, there were 24 camps. Fort Henry was used mainly for housing so-called first-class prisoners of war, that is actual German prisoners of war, um, and some Austrian Germans and a few Ottoman Turkish citizens. Most of the East Europeans, and he said most of the people in that image behind me were uh, Ukrainians or other East Europeans, were eventually moved to CFP Petawawa, uh, to help build the artillery range there, and then moved on to Campus Casing, which was another one of the camps. That's from uh, the last camp that Sakaluk was in. Eventually, ironically, he was paroled to work in a munitions factory. <laughs> so, you know, here's an enemy alien, supposedly a security threat, um, who ends up working, making ammunition for the Canadians on, on, the, on the Western Front. So there were all these camps. Um, your viewers may be saying, well, because we started with the 20th of June, what's so special about that? Well, Again, think about it. We annually appropriately commemorate the armistice that brought the First World War, the Great War, to an end, the 11th of November, 1918, Remembrance Day. So we pause for two minutes of silence, or we should if we don't, those who don't should. Um, and we remember all the fallen from the First World War and all the other wars that Canada's been involved in. Um, the internment operations continued until June of 1920. Um, so partially because there was the Red Scare, partially because this was a source of cheap labor. These people worked uh, for next to nothing for the profit of their jailers, not only the federal and provincial governments, but various private concerns. And then at the end of it, you could get rid of them. So some of them were actually deported. So this was a, a very disruptive uh, time in Ukrainian Canadian, in fact, Eastern Can Ukraine, sorry, Eastern European Canadian history. Uh, it involved the Croatian community, the Serbian community and others. It was a very disruptive time. The most, uh, the greatest impact was probably felt by German Canadians and Ukrainian Canadians. Um, something they've only, as I say, just begun to recover from. And very often, um, part of the problem was that people didn't know about it, like we said. Um, I remember watching a film that was done with a survivor by the name of Nick Lipka. And Mr. Lipka, who had been interned in several camps at the end of this interview, says, I don't really want to talk very much about this anymore. I could be interned again. So there was still that fear. And we have documents. We have information from RCMP informants in the community and from OSS agents who were the forerunner of the CIA, who were active in Canada in 1940, who say... Ukrainian Canadians, their leaders anyway, are still, quote, in fear of the barbed wire fence. I think that's pretty unambiguous. Mm -hmm. They were still afraid in 1940 that they might be rounded up again. So many of them volunteered for service in the Canadian forces to prove their loyalty unequivocally. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting story, and it, and it all starts here in Kingston, which is the really cool part. So on the 20th of June, we'll be commemorating and remembering uh, the internment operations in their end, we'll be hollowing all the victims of the internment operations. Uh, there'll be a half-page notice in the national edition of the Globe and Mail. And quite frankly, I'll say a little prayer for Mrs. Carter Tanuk, who <laughs> pointed me toward uh, Nick Sekuluk, and I'll say a little prayer for Nick Sekuluk uh, to thank him for uh, leading me onto a path that literally changed the rest of my professional and academic life and uh, personal life.
To turn this back for just a moment to the COVID-19 situation, sure. um, were there any observances planned outside of what you're now having to do? Um, uh, was there anything planned that was going to be more in the public, more... Uh, um... Yes, yes, there was. Um, but it became very evident by, as we all know, by sort of mid-February, early March, that that wasn't going to be possible. So there were various kinds of commemorative events planned for right across the country. Uh, instead of doing that, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, um, some people may remember Alexandra Hitchi, she's the current president. She was a lawyer here in Kingston uh, for a time. She's now the president of the UCC. Um, there, were, there were going to be commemorative events from coast to coast. We can't do it anymore. So instead, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, the national level, and some of the provincial councils has uh, done a kind of a countdown series. So there are 20 video episodes that began on the 1st of June and are being broadcast um, on social media. Um, you can see, share the links with you if you like, that have people like Premier Jason Kenney talking about um, how he negotiated the settlement. In fact, very kindly, he makes a nice comment about how I did the research that led to that settlement. Uh, we have you know, descendants speaking. We have people reading the list of the names of the camps. We have, uh, well, I'm speaking, uh, as are several other academics, about uh, you know, what happened and why. My, my own daughter, Cassandra Lechuk, who's doing her PhD in history now at the University of Toronto, just published a book called Enemy Aliens, a, a graphic novel, and, uh, and she's being featured. Uh, Mark Menenko, who just got his PhD in, in England uh, about the sort of legal history of the internment operations is interviewed. So there's a whole range of people from descendants to scholars, uh, to community activists, to uh, artists of various kinds, who are reflecting on what happened and what ended, you know, saying, quite frankly, um, this was an unhappy episode in Canadian history. But at the same time, also, Steve, emphasizing a certain point that I think your viewers may want to, you know, keep in mind. We can do this in Canada. We can talk about an episode in our national history that was unhappy, unwarranted, an injustice, we can recall it, we can bring it back to memory, and we're not suppressed for doing that. Now, even at the national level, here's another thing that was canceled, the Canadian Museum of History, a beautiful museum in Gatineau, you, I'm sure you've been there, had intended to unveil a major new exhibit on the War Measures Act. It was actually originally my idea, and they ran with it. So there are gonna be three uh, uh, zones in this exhibit, one that deals with Canada's first national internment operations in World War I era, the Second World War, and the War Measures Act, because it's the 50th anniversary of the Quebec crisis. So that had to be postponed. It was supposed to be opened on the 30th of September of this year, the 100th anniversary of the end of the internment operations, the 50th anniversary of the Quebec crisis. It can't be because of COVID. So it's being delayed. Um, many of your viewers, I'm sure, have seen on CBC or in the movie theaters and in other venues uh, heritage minutes of various kinds. We commissioned a heritage minute on Canada's first national tournament operations. It has to be postponed because I can't do live filming. So, you know, there are these things that have had to be delayed. So we have adjusted, and as, you know, your viewers are interested in sort of what are we doing because of COVID? Um, well, we're putting things in social media. We're doing interviews like this. We're writing articles. We are trying to um, communicate um, the, the importance of the date by publishing a notice in the Globe and Mail National Edition. Over four and a half to 5,000 postcards featuring that notice from the Globe and Mail will be mailed out across Canada. So there are, you know, a variety of different means by which we can use social media and Canada Post and notices in major newspapers, interviews to remember what happened and pay due respect to Mr. Sekaluk and all the other men and women and children who were held like him in Canadian internment camps during the First World War period.
Well, Professor Lechuk, it's always interesting to talk to you. I always learn something out of it, and um, that's, that's a great thing. And I'm glad we could do our share to, uh, to publicize this, especially since the ability to do so during the pandemic is, uh, is limited. Um, thanks for doing what you do and bringing this to, uh, to our attention, and um, I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thank you. Be safe and be of good cheer. Yeah, you too. Stay safe. 